Good evening and welcome to another episode of Change of Raiment. As always, it is a great honor and privilege for me to be sitting before you, sharing these wonderful truths from the Word of God with you as it relates to change of raiment. And as I'm studying these principles and the Lord is imparting to me, it is, as I said, a great honor to be able to share what I'm learning as we are all on this journey so that God can not only change our literal raiment, but more so to change our character, to change our spiritual raiment so that we can be arrayed in his linen, clean and white. Amen. Victory over sin. So before we proceed any further, we're going to have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you once again for allowing us here to gather in your presence. We thank you for your presence here with us tonight. And we ask that as we learn about these truths from your word, that you will help us to make the necessary surrender and changes in our lives. And we ask that we will not kick against the pricks, but that we will be like the faithful Bereans, go back and restudy these things and be able to incorporate these principles into our daily lives. We thank you for hearing and answering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our topic this evening is, it's my hair. Does God really care? And we are going to be answering that question. As a matter of fact, from the very inception, let's address that question. It's my hair. Does God really care? Now, of course, we know in the scripture, the Bible is clear that we are not our own that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, right? And that we are but stewards of our bodies. We are stewards of everything that pertains to our bodies. So really and truly, our hair being a part of our being is God's. So we, it's incumbent upon us that our hair reflects God. Now, of course, we know the principle, and we've been sharing this throughout all of the uh, different presentations, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 that whatever we do should be done to the glory of God. Now, does that include our hair? It absolutely does. We should reflect Christ. We should glorify Christ in our manner of dressing, in our deportment, in everything that we do. Yea, even in our hair. So does God care about our hair? Absolutely. And there's two of my favorite scriptures. It's found in Matthew um, chapter 10, verse 30, and also it's found in Luke chapter 12, verse 7. Very familiar scripture. I'm sure you all are familiar with this. And it says that God, that but even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than sparrows. Now, let me ask you all in the chat and you that will watch this later on. Do any of you know how many hairs are on your head? Absolutely not. Unless you're bald, then you don't have any, right? So it's easy to know how many you have. You don't have any. But for the most part, none of us know how many hairs are on our head. But this scripture goes deeper than just God knowing how many hairs we have on our head. It says the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do you know what that means? Each and every strand of hair on your head has a specific number. Now, if you're like me, whenever I take my hair out of my bun or whatever, or when I comb my hair, I lose hair all, all the time. Sometimes there's pieces of hair that come out, right? But God, he takes so much special care into each and every one of us that he pays attention to every detail of our lives, things that to us are insignificant. How significant is it for us to know the numbers of our hair or to even number our hair? But yet God cares and he loves his children so much that he numbers the very hair of our head. And that's why he says, Fear not. You are valued, right? If God numbers the hair, I could go on and on, but it's a beautiful promise. You know, the Bible mentions hair at uh, 60 times. You all can fact check me on that, but I believe it's um, 60 times that the word hair is mentioned in scripture. So there is instruction, just as there is instruction given on how we are to dress ourselves, there is adequate ex instruction in the word of God on how we are to have our hair. And did you know, I'm just going to share a few of my favorite um, scriptures on hair and we'll get back to these later. I'm laying a foundation and then we're going to move forward and you'll see why I'm mentioning all this from the very inception. In Proverbs 16, 31, the Bible mentions that the gray hair is what? Is a crown of glory, right? Again, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 15 mentions the long hair of the woman being given her for a covering and being her glory. Also, we see hair mentioned with the Nazarite vow in number six and how the hair 
uh, was a symbol of allegiance to God and loyalty to God. So all throughout scripture, we're seeing hair and the significance of that. So there is instruction. And what I found very interesting in Luke chapter 21, and I'm actually going to read this scripture, verses 17 and 18, there's an end time tribal prophecy that's related to our hair. Did you all know that? Yes, absolutely. Again, it's Luke 21, 17 and 18. And it says here, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not an hair of your head perish. Doesn't God care for his children? Not one strand of hair will perish. What does this remind you all of? Does this remind you of, because we know we're facing perilous times when God's people will be persecuted. We know we're the time of the um, mark of the beast is right upon us. We see that week after week um, in the sermons, in the power surges, we see that the image of the beast is being set up. Is there another Old Testament account wherein uh, there was a, a crisis, a crisis of where an image was set up and God's people were for, forced to worship? What is that account? Put it in the chat there. Of course, we know that that's Daniel 3 with the three Hebrew worthies, how that they did not bow down to the image of the beast. And as a result, they were persecuted. They were thrown into the midst of the fiery furnace. What does the Bible specify in Daniel chapter 3, verse 27? That not a hair of their head was singed. Isn't that beautiful? Not a hair of their head their head was sin. So does God care about our hair? Yes. Does he give us instructions of how we should deal with our hair? Yes, he does. So with that foundation being laid, we are going to go to the screen and we are going to look at this first principle. Now, week after week, we've been laboring to show you various principles from the word of God of what should characterize our dress, how our dress should be from the very first lesson all the way up to the present. We have been laying the foundation and showing from the Bible and also confirming from the spirit of prophecy how it is we are to dress. And so the same principles, the very principles that characterize, that should characterize, I should say, our dress should also characterize our hair. So what are those principles? Let's go to the screen and look at those principles. And if you'll notice in yellow in parentheses, the scripture is given. Okay, because you, you all may be thinking that, oh, Sister Hillary is sharing a lot from Ellen White's writing a lot from the spirit of prophecy. Those are merely confirming principles. Where does she get those principles from? From the word of God. So every sing single principle that has been laid out as it relates to our dress, there's a biblical principle behind that, right? Okay, so the first one says here that our hair must be done to the glory of God, right? Now, what does the first angel's message say? Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And again, what does 1 Corinthians 10, 31 say? Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So we see here that dress reform, health reform, yea, even hair reform is a part of that first angel's message. I digress there. There's more that can be said. The second principle, second bullet point, our hair must be simple. Our hair must not be extravagant, outlandish, or designed to draw attention to ourselves. We find the principles there in 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4. We are going to deal in detail with both of those scriptures as we move forward. The hair mustn't have added attachments, adornments, embellishments, or ornaments. The same scriptures, right? Last bullet point on the page, hair must follow principles of health. So our hair must be clean. We shouldn't be going months <laughs> without washing our hair, right? Our hair must be healthful. So we mustn't be putting chemicals in our hair that would damage our body. Our skin is a semi-permeable membrane, meaning whatever we put on the skin, whatever we put in the hair is going to enter into the body. So the products we use have to be free of chemicals, dyes, harmful ingredients, artificial ingredients, right? And of course, our, it's not healthy if our hair is pulled too tightly and pulled in unnatural positions, putting pressure on the head and even damaging the hair follicles itself. All right, if we look at the next screen, we continue with the bullet points. Our hair must be neat. Everything we do must be done decently and in order, right? And to God's glory. Does it glorify God if our hair is in these spikes sticking up in every direction? No, our hair must be neat, right? Must be simple, as we said before. Our hair must be natural in color. I should also say in texture. We'll get to that later. So again, no hair dyeing as that is unnatural and it's unhealthful, you see the scriptures there. Also, this principle is very important. 
Hair should not be androgynous or unisex, but should reflect one's gender. The Bible is clear that it's a shame for men to have long hair. Neither should women have masculine hairstyles. They should not intentionally cut their hair in a way that would resemble or pertain to that of a man. And really and truly, based on the dress and the society that we live in today, it's sometimes very hard and perplexing to determine the gender or the sex of a person based on, again, the dress and the hair. You have men with this long flowing hair these days, and then you have women with very short hair, and then the way they're dressing, it's like, is, is that a man or is that a woman? That shouldn't be. There should be a clear distinction uh, between the dress of a man and a woman. There should be a clear distinction also in the hair. Okay, so with that said, let's move on to our key scriptures. These are our thematic scriptures that we are going to deal with. So what does the Bible mean by broided hair, plaiting the hair? Because there's some people that take the position or may be wondering, is the Bible prohibiting a simple style of plaiting or braiding my own natural hair? What does the Bible mean by broidering broidering the hair or plaiting the hair? We're going to delve into that. So again, let's read these two scriptures. Very important. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. There we see the apparel, right? And what's linked with it? The hair. With shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Next scripture, 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of what? Plating the hair and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So people may turn to this and say, wow, so this means I can't braid my daughter's hair. I can't put her hair in two little cute braids or I can't braid her own natural hair. I looked up these two words in the Bible concordance. The word is there. The Greek word for both and also the number is there. So if you're taking notes, write it down or you can take a screenshot. Maybe that would be easier. So basically broidered, as you can see, it says more in quantity, more in number or quality, above, exceed, more excellent, further, greater, longer, more excellent. I guess we put that twice, further or many. So what does broided hair here mean? it means that you're adding something on to make it more in quantity, right? You're adding something on to make it more excellent. You're trying to embellish it. You're making it longer. Does this not sound like extensions, attachments, right? Artificial attachments, weaves, adding um, unnatural things to your hair. Look at the definition for plaiting here. Elaborate braiding of the hair. Again, we said our hair should be simple. Now, both of these scriptures in 1 Timothy 2 and also in 1 Peter 3 mention the word adorn. Let's look at the word adorn and we'll see further what this means. So from the concordance, we see that the word adorn or adorning means to decorate or to garnish. So when you're garnishing or decorating something, what are you doing? Are you not adding something to it to further beautify it? Right? Think about it, you individuals that love to cook or to bake. Well, let's say cook. So you make a nice dish and then you want to just make it a little more special. What do you do? You add something to it. So maybe you cut up, um, let's just say a tomato based on what the dish is. You cut up a tomato in a fancy way to make it, you know, maybe look like a flower or what have you. Or you cut your avocado in a way to make it look too embellish, right? Now, of course, you'll eat it as well, but it's there for garnish. So you're adding to the dish to further beautify it, right? Now, let me ask you all this question. Can we improve upon what God has done? Why are we trying to add something? That Now, God gave us our hair, right? The hair that grows out of our scalp. God gave that to us. Why are we trying to add on to make it longer, to make it more beautiful, to make it more elaborate? Right? God gave us our hair. It's natural, but we want to add the artificial on, right? That's the broidering that God's talking about. That's the adorning that God is um, talking about in these scriptures here. Let's go back to the screen here because I want to show you something. So now from the dictionary to adorn means to embellish, to add on or to add something to enhance or to make more beautiful. 
Again, if we go back to the definition of broidered, what did it say? It said to more in quantity. And that's what happens when people put these extensions on. Sometimes the extensions are going all the way down their back, right? It makes the hair fuller. They're adding. They're trying to embellish. They're adding on, right? The Bible prohibits this. You're trying to make it more excellent. You're trying, again, to improve upon what God has given you. Okay, so let's go back to adornment. So what do the ador adornments here include? It includes your accessories, people adding gold and jewelry. Now it's a big thing. People are adding um, jewels to their hair, right? They're adding accessories. They're adding ornaments, decorations. They're also adding hair. So to adorn, look at that last um, sentence there. To adorn something or one's person means to add something, which not only includes the hair jewelry, the beads and such the like, even people put seashells sometime in their hair, um, but also the false hair, the artificial hair, right? And the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, the Bible demands that we be more than surface readers. So I want to go back one more time to 1 Peter chapter 3 to prove this point. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. Let me ask you this question. Is the putting on of apparel wrong? Should we not put on apparel? Think about it. When Adam and Eve sinned and they, they lost the covering of light, what did God do? And then they made fig leaf garments that still left them naked and exposed. What did God do? Did God not give them coats of skin? Did God not give them apparel? So if the Bible was here merely condemning the braiding of one's own natural hair that grows out of their scalp, then you could easily take this and say here, well, that means that God is also telling us that we're not to put on apparel. And we know that that's preposterous. We are to put on apparel. The, the key is what type of apparel, right? The modest apparel, the simple apparel, the, uh, the apparel that glorifies his name, not the revealing apparel, not the exorbitant, extravagant apparel, the apparel that he approves of, right? Okay. So, and if you look at these scriptures, everything else that is mentioned here is something that you put on. You can't put on your hair. God is, God is the one that gives you your hair, right? You don't put on your own hair. So I'm just proving the point to share here that if you put your hair in a simple style that's neat and that uh, follow all the, follows all the principles of hair reform that we looked on, it's neat, it's simple, it's not extravagant, it's natural, right? There's nothing prohibiting you from putting your hair um, in simple braided style. Now, when you begin to add the accessories, add the ornamentations, add the extensions, that's when it is prohibited in scripture. So I hope that point is made here for those of you that, that were wondering. All right, so here on the screen, we have some examples of some simple braids with natural hair that can be worn. No attachments, no um, jewelry in the hair, no weave, no extensions. And we'll see from the spirit of prophecy also why um, God does not um, want us to add these things to our hair. Not only from a modesty and simplicity perspective, and also, a, like I said, a discontentment, because a lot of times people wear these things, not always, I don't know everyone's motive, sometimes it may be for convenience, but many people put in the attachments and the extension for convenience, but other people put it in because they think, well, my hair is inadequate. I, I don't like my hair, so I have to add weave to make it more beautiful. I have to let it lay down a certain way. I have to add these e extensions so that it can look more beautiful. Again, you cannot improve upon what God has done. There's nothing more beautiful than natural simplicity. Amen? All right. So as we showed you, um, pictures of the natural braids that you can do. We're going to show you examples of the broidering and the broidering and plaiting of the hair that the word of God condemns. So here we see um, these artificial colors. We see hair extensions. We see jewelry in the hair. And of course, um, this is no new fashion. These long extensions and these braided wigs also and even the jewels um, intertwined in the braids and the hair. This goes back to ancient Egypt and other cultures, um, even during that time and even before. They've been doing this for <laughs> centuries, for a, a very, very long time, right? Even thousands of years. And so we see the unnatural colors. We see the, the extensions that are added. 
We see um, on the right here of the screen, we see jewelry embedded in the braids. These are elaborate styles. These are styles that do not reflect simplicity, modesty, um, but rather it, it draws attention, right? Again. All right, so now let's go to the spirit of prophecy. Does the spirit of prophecy say anything about um, extensions, right? Weave, artificial hair. And when I say artificial hair, I'm not just talking about the extension braids. I'm talking about everything, all artificial hair, whether it's human hair, whether it's horse's hair, hair that you buy and that you add to your own hair, okay? Or that you cover up your own hair with. I'm talking about all of that, even wigs. So it says, fashion loads the heads of women with artificial braids and pads, which do not add to their beauty, but give an unnatural shape to the head. Now we've dealt with the adding of extensions from a modesty perspective from the Bible. Sister White here is going to share with us from a health perspective why it's not healthy to add these things to one's hair, okay? It says the hair is strained and forced into unnatural positions and it is not possible for the heads of these fashionable ladies to be comfortable. The artificial hair and pads covering the base of the brain heat and excite the spinal nerves centering in the brain. The head should ever be kept cool. The heat caused by these artificials induces the blood to the brain. The action of the blood upon the lower or animal organs of the brain causes unnatural activity, tends to recklessness in morals, and the mind and heart is in danger of being corrupted. So not only you see the health, but you also see that the morals are affected. As the animal organs are excited and strengthened, the moral are enfeebled. The moral and intellectual powers of the mind becomes servant to the mind. Now, many of us may have been unaware of this and may not have known, and of course, if we're ignorant of certain principles, and I believe I said this in our last presentation, that God won't hold you accountable for that which you um, did not know previously, right? So if you didn't know these things, take it to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help you to come in line and to be content with the hair that God has given you. You don't need to add. Again, you can't improve upon what God has given. Ask him for wisdom. He does care about our hair. Everything that pertains to each and every one of us, God cares about. There's nothing too small or insignificant that we can't go to God about. So if you're struggling with your hair and you say, well, I just put these things in my hair because I just don't know how to do it or what have you, ask the Lord. He will help you. And he may even put you in contact with somebody that can help you as well. All right. So um, on the point also of artificial hair, I'm just going to reference this. This is also from the health reformer. You see the reference there, October 1st. This is talking about hair switches and chignons. These are also pieces that were very popular that people were adding on to their hair. And again, this statement talks about how it was unhealthy to wear. So I'm not going to take the time. You, you can pause the screen. You can take the reference. You can check it and you can read that. Okay. So I have a picture there. That's what is talked about. That's what the switches, jutes, and chignons are. On the next slide as well, you can see more. So it's these added pieces to the back of the head, the ponytails, the buns, etc. Hair basically that's not, your, that's not growing out of your scalp. These things are not healthful, neither are they modest. And since 1 Corinthians 11, I believe it's verse 15, says that God has given a woman her hair, sorry, that the woman's hair is her glory, right? When you put these things on, are you not, covering that glory, right? Are you not saying that my hair is inadequate, therefore I have to add to to make it more beautiful? No, be content. Be content with the natural hair that God is giving you. And if you take this position to say, well, my hair is just short or my hair is not a texture that I like, so that's why I like to wear wigs or this or that or what have you, well, then you would take the same position and say, perhaps, you know, well, I don't like the color of my skin, so I'm going to brighten my skin with this makeup. Isn't that the same principle? And isn't it kind of like bearing false witness when you're wearing these things as though it's yours, but it's really not? Well, it might be yours. You may have purchased it. But what I'm saying is it's, it's not growing out of your, your head, right? So be content how God made you. Ask him for wisdom, and he will help you to know um, how you are to, to do your hair, okay? So now with that said, we're going to talk about the chemicals, adding the chemicals to the hair. 
Does the spirit of prophecy say anything about um, adding chemicals, artificial chemicals to your hair? Now, let's read this and then we're going to talk about how dangerous and how deadly even it is to be adding perms and adding relaxers and texturizers and dyes and these artificial chemicals to your hair. Look at the experience of Ellen White and James White. Ellen White says, I've had some experience in using Mrs. S.A. Allen's World's Hair Restorative, also Hall's Vegetable Sicilian Hair Restorative. So apparently she was trying to prevent her husband's hair from falling out. And there's many products on the market right today that uh, make these claims that it will stop hair loss. You have the just for men and whatever, and you have ones for ladies too, but they're chemicals. So let's see what their experience was. So now she says, I've made applications of these preparations upon the head of my husband to prevent the falling off of the hair. I observed that when using these preparations, he frequently complained of giddiness of the head and weakness and pain in the eyes. So this chemical was so strong. What do you think of when you think of giddiness of the head? No, I've never done drugs. I've never drank. I've never taken um, caffeine, coffee or anything like that. So I don't know what getting high feels like. But when I read giddiness of the head, that's what I'm thinking about, what it means. He was kind of loopy, right? So look at the effect. And not only James White, who was receiving the application, but Ellen White herself, who was applying the application. So when you're working with chemicals, whether you're the person receiving it or you're the person administering it, the health um, detriments will affect both persons. So she says here, in applying these preparation, my eyes that were naturally strong grew weak and twice seemed to be greatly inflamed. Eruptions appeared upon the lids and continued for weeks. I was convinced that I was poisoned by applying these preparations to the head of my husband. And what did she do? She kept doing it, right? Because it was allowing his hair not to fall out. No, she said we discontinued its use, right? And there's so many people today that are suffering with cancer. And you can look this up, you can go to Google and look this up, that they have linked um, perms, especially with African-American women that are putting these relaxers in their hair. Well, I wouldn't, won't just say African-American, but women of African descent that are putting these relaxers in their hair to chemically straighten their hair. They are suffering with uterine cancer, fibroids, and all kinds of other problems. And a lot of them are suing the various um, companies, relaxer companies, and some of them are getting compensation from it because they're, they're getting cancers, breast cancer as well. So if we look at the next screen, look at all these things that um, come as a result. Look at the dangers of these chemicals. And when I say relaxers, I'm talking about the texturizers. I'm also, I'm not just talking about for, you know, um, the perms that make people's hair straight. I'm also talking about the chemical that make people's hair curly because there's perms that do that too. The unnatural chemicals, that's the point we're making. They have carcinogenic chemicals such as lye, formaldehyde, parabens, ammonia, etc. Many other chemicals. It causes skin irritation, gives a higher risk of breast cancer, uterine cancer, and other cancers. There's hormonal disruptions, fibroids, cysts, reproductive damage. Again, I encourage you, go on Google and look up the link between these perms and these um, health problems, specifically cancer, hair damage, alopecia, right? And that's the falling out of the hair. Many women are suffering with that today. And that, if, if it's only alopecia, let's say praise God, and not cancer and some of these other more damaging, deadly um, conditions. Now, I am a woman of African descent, all right? I, for all of my adult life, I've had natural hair. My hair has always been thick. It has always been uh, kinky, right? It's always been tightly curled, okay? My hair is, can be difficult to manage. So I know a lot of you that are watching and who will watch later can relate to this. Most of my childhood, my hair was natural, right? Thick, big hair, big Afro hair. I love my natural hair. Praise God for it, right? Um, I'm content with it. I would say I got my first perm when I was a preteen, and that's only because my sister and I, we begged our parents. They weren't going to give us perms, but we saw other classmates at school. They had their hair 
you know, that was laying down nice and it seemed so manageable. And here we had two little chunky twists on the side of our heads and we got made fun of. So we begged our parents, let us get some perm. Let's, let's get a relaxer. And let me tell you, the first relaxer that me and my sister got, it was horrible. It was a terrible experience. Our hair was burned. Our scalp was burned. We could literally scratch our heads and pieces of our scalp would come off in our fingernail. But guess what? Because we were young and we wanted to look like everybody else, we kept asking, we just said, well, maybe it's the person that did our hair. So let's, let's find someone else. And we kept getting perms. But like I said, it was for a short span of time that I put these chemicals in my hair. So I know the struggle. I know it very well. I'm a type of person, I, like Pastor was talking about time management in his sermon, I don't like to spend a lot of time on hair. So I'm not particularly that good with my hair. With the length and the thickness and the kinkiness of my hair, if I'm washing my hair, it can take, and, and then detangling, and then putting it in a style that's not going to cause it to mat up and cause it to get tangled again, that can sometimes take, well, I, I don't even want to say it, more than four hours. It could take more than six hours. And then I have a daughter whose hair is just, at, well, even more tightly curled than mine. So you, I, I know the struggle. I've been, like I said, all of my adult life, I've had natural hair. I now have a daughter with natural hair. And praise God, we're never going to put chemicals in her hair to straighten her hair. We're content with the hair that God has given us. But we have to ask God for wisdom. And I thank God for my sister. She knows who she is. She helped me out in those early years. Uh, she would help me with my hair. She handled her hand a little faster than I could. I have another church sister that helps me and my daughter with her hair, and I'm grateful. So ask the Lord <laughs> to put people in your path that can help you to manage your hair, right, in the texture that it is. But don't resort to destroying, and, and I say all that to say, I'm not sitting on a high horse as someone that is saying, you know, I don't understand the struggle. I understand, I go through it every day. Every time I have to wash my hair, I go through a struggle. But guess what? Is it worth it? Yes, because God gave it to us. God gave us all different types of textures. And there's things that you can do with your hair to make your hair modest, natural, simple, but also look nice as well. Whatever texture, whether it's really straight and thin, there's things you can do. Whether it's really kinky and big, Afro hair, like the kind of hair I have, there's things that you can do with it, right? So don't resort to putting in these extensions just to, you know, manage the hair or even these um, chemicals because you're going to pay a, a terrible price, maybe pay the price with your life. So now, okay, I think we made the point there. We are going to go to our final point, and that is going to be with locks. All right, now I'm not going to go any further than what the Bible says on this topic. And when I say locks, I'm talking about Rasta locks, sister locks, freeform locks. I don't know, I'm not a specialist with locks or anything like that. So I don't know the types. There's many, many different types um, of locks. So concerning that, I'm not gonna mention the Nazarite vow. Let me say this. So I'm primarily talking to women because again, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 says that men should not, it's a shame for men to have long hair. So I'm not even addressing the men here, okay? I'm talking about the women. So when we consider the locks and any type of hair style, these are some principles I want you to go to the Lord in prayer with, okay? So ask yourself, is Christ glorified by this hairstyle? All right? Is it modest? Is it simple? All right? Is it practical? Is it economical? Or it, does it cost me exorbitant amount of money to do into main hair? Tame. Is it healthful? Is it hygienic? What is your influence among believers and unbelievers by having this particular hairstyle? What associations are made because of this hairstyle, right? What is your motive behind this style? Is it indolence? I don't want to do it. I don't want to deal with it. So let me just throw it in this type of style. Is it vanity? Is it pride? Is it to be in alignment with the worldly fashion or is it to glorify God? Once you answer these questions, the Lord will direct you as to whether or not you should be wearing certain types of hairstyles and that includes the locks. Now let me just say this lastly on the point of locks as well. I would encourage you to do some research, look into the history of them, the various types, um, and I want you to see what that says. 
see what type of um, religions are associated with locks, and then go through this checklist, answer the questions honestly in prayer to God, let him lead you, and you will see whether or not this is a hairstyle that you should have, right? I'm not going to tell you yay or nay. Again, I'm not your conscience. Go to God, answer these questions honestly, and he will lead you as to whether or not you should wear this particular hairstyle, locks, or as I said before, any other type of hairstyle. Now, let me deal with some important principles. I know we're out of time here. So there are people that have certain conditions like alopecia. There are certain people that, women, I'm talking about again, there may be women who don't have, uh, whose hair can't grow past a certain length, so their hair is short. Again, you're not going to um, style your hair in a man's hairstyle because of that, right? You're not going to resort to breaking principle based on circumstances, okay? Again, go to God. He understands, and he, is, he allows everything to happen, right? But we cannot break the principles of God's word um, for any reason. And some people maybe say, oh, well, you're saying that because you don't have these conditions. Well, if God, you know, if that becomes my lot, I pray that I will have godliness with contentment. It's all about godliness with contentment, which is great gain, right? Okay, now let me talk about, I didn't talk much about dyeing of the hair. Now, we did in the first slide. We shouldn't be dyeing our hair. That is not natural. That's chemicals, all right? Now, of course, everybody would say, amen, yes, we're not to dye our hair red, green, pink, purple, what else? Um, all of these bright, fancy colors. If your hair's black, you're not going to dye it blonde, right? If your hair's this color, you're not going to dye it this color. But let's say I'm aging, and now I'm seeing these grays pop up. Is it wrong for me to dye my gray back to the original color of my hair? Friends, aging is a part of life. It's something that we all go through. There's different changes that we go through as we get older. You know, we slow down, <laughs> we get wrinkles, we get gray hair, right? It's a part of life. Again, there's some scriptures. I think I had quoted um, Proverbs 1631, dealing with the hoary head being a crown of glory. And there's another scripture I want to address, which also says the beauty of old men is the gray head. So there is beauty and wisdom in gray hair. Okay, so don't despise it. Yes, sometimes your grays may be a different texture than the rest of your hair. Again, if we take the position to say, I'm going to dye my hair, my gray hair back to the original color. Well, what are you going to do when you start getting all these wrinkles? You're going to justify now, well, I don't want these wrinkles, so I'm going to get Botox in my eyes or wherever they get it. In my, I don't know where they get it, wherever they get it, in my face, I'm going to get Botox. We can't break a principle um, from the word of God especially and resort to these unnatural ways. Godliness with contentment is great gain. There's much more that can be said, but this is not a uh, topic on hair, right? I'm not an expert on hair. I'm just sharing with you um, the word of God. The last slide I'll go to, and I'm going to reference these statements here. I'm not going to take the time to read them. You can read them yourselves. We dealt with a presentation that talked about uh, dressing in the house of God. So also this statement deals with how we should present ourselves as it relates to our hair in the house of God, because we represent God. So this is talking about a class of people that come in the house of God dressed anyhow with their regular everyday work clothes. And look what uh, the second paragraph here says. And I don't think that reference for that, that's not the great controversy 428. That is actually Okay, that, yeah, that reference is wrong. I'm going to have to redo that reference. I know that's not from the Great Controversy. That should be from uh, Testimonies, Volume 5. Anyway, but it says here that, look at the gold part. If we were to appear in the presence of a guest, right, with the best apparel that could be attained, for this friend would be insulted were they to come into his presence with their hair uncombed and garments uncleanly and in order. So how should we come into the house of God? Now it's becoming a popular style for people to walk around and have their hair uncombed. You've seen it, right? But it, and sometimes we even venture into the house of God with it like that. So if our hair is uncombed, it's a possibility that it hasn't been cleaned either. Now look at this last statement here. 
And this is from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, talking about the ministers in the sacred desk. Yellow part, ministers sometimes stand in the desk with their hair in disorder, looking as if it had been untouched by comb and brush for a week. So, of course, the ministers are to be an example to the flock. So if their hair is looking like this, then people are going to have irreverence in the house of God, and they're going to start dressing and keeping their hair in a way that doesn't represent God. Remember, everywhere we go, whatever we do, however we present ourselves, we represent God. People know what our profession is as Seventh-day Adventists. So we don't want to give a, a misrepresentation of God and the truths that we believe by our laxity in our dress, neither by our um, non-adherence to the principles of dress reform or hair reform. Okay, again, much more can always be said, but praise God that you all have tuned in today. Let's close out with a word of prayer, and by God's grace, we'll see you next week. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these principles. We ask, Lord, that you will allow them to be as a nail in a sure place, and that where changes need to be made, that you will help us, Father. And we pray that we will rightly represent you in whatsoever we do. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.